All right, everyone, welcome back. It's Veronica Howard. So in this third unit, we're talking all about antecedent control and the way in which the context or the stimuli that occur before behavior influence the response that our learners emit. Uh, previously, we've talked a little bit about stimulus control. How does behavior become more likely in the presence of certain environmental circumstances? And so when we're talking about teaching and evoking or setting the occasion for responses, it's great when we have behavior that's occurring frequently, when we have behavior that's happening a lot. Sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes the behavior doesn't occur naturally in the presence of a desired antecedent stimulus. So what we have to do is kind of set the occasion or create an artificial way of getting the behavior to happen so we can capture it. That's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna to be talking about prompting and the prompt hierarchies in this first section. But first, let's begin with a little review. Remember that we were talking about where and when behavior happens. So we know that a discriminative stimulus is a stimulus that precedes a behavior and it's present only when reinforcement will occur for that response. So it's kind of like the stimulus that tells you where and when and under what circumstances to emit the behavior so you can earn the reinforcer. We can do a formal procedure called discrimination training, where we make the behavior happen in a narrower range of environmental circumstances, where we, we narrow down how often or under what circumstances a person emits that response. And we do that by reinforcing the behavior when it happens under certain circumstances or in one stimulus context, and we extinguish the behavior in all of the responses. But again, in this discrimination training paradigm, you have to have the behavior occurring at least a little bit so you can capture it with reinforcement. We also refer to that behavior as being under stimulus control. And stimulus control is that increased probability of the behavior happening in the presence of the discriminative stimulus. If you have behavior that doesn't occur, it can't come under stimulus control. And if we're trying to increase the probability of behavior happening, we have to move to something called prompting. So prompting is an additional antecedent stimulus. It's something that we add to the environment before behavior occurs to increase the probability that the person's gonna make a correct response or they're going to emit the behavior that will contact reinforcement. And we're trying to, the aim of prompting is to increase the probability of a response under certain circumstances so that eventually we can fade out or remove that prompt and have a natural SD take over and maintain that response. When we're talking about using prompting, we do this because the behavior doesn't happen under stimulus control. It's not happening naturally and we need it to happen. So for instance, imagine that I'm working with a client. In this case, maybe my client is my dog. And I say that my dog knows how to sit, which means that I've seen evidence that the behavior is in my dog's repertoire. But the dog doesn't emit the behavior when I'm giving them the instruction to sit. So we see that we have that response sit, but it's not occurring when it should be. The antecedent stimulus is sit. That's the antecedent that we want to control the behavior. That's the target discriminative stimulus. And we want to bring behavior under control of that response. I give the instruction and dog doesn't respond. So what I can do is I can add in a particular hand gesture that's known to work really well. So in my time working with dogs in a shelter, if you hold a treat in your hand and you just move that hand backwards above a dog's head, what will happen is their little head will follow the treat and they'll just sort of naturally sit. This works for about 80% of dogs. So my natural discriminative stimulus, the stimulus that I want to control the behavior, is the instruction sit. But what I'm going to do, at least for a little bit, is I'm going to add in a kind of gestural prompt. I'm going to use my hand and just kind of, tr you know, trick the dog into sitting. And then eventually when they start to get it, I can remove that prompt. When we're talking about using prompting effectively, do bear in mind that I might start here by giving that instruction and then use the treat to kind of lure the dog into the position. This is a gestural or a positional prompt. When that dog is in the sitting position, I absolutely have to give the reinforcer. So it's not that we can just prompt and prompt and prompt and the behavior will happen and we just, we're just we thankful for it. You must give the reinforcer. And then we're going to continue doing these trials with the prompt until the dog gets pretty fluent. So I'm going to give the instruction to sit, and then I'm going to do the hand, and then we're going to, if they sit, give the reinforcer. Then we give the instruction to sit, and we're going to do the hand, and then if they sit, give them the reinforcer. And you'll start to notice they get quicker, the faster over time, almost like the behavior is starting to come under 
control of at least one of those stimuli. But I have to be careful because if I'm not being mindful of how I'm using that prompt, they could become a little bit dependent on it. So I have to really be careful when I'm using prompting because prompts have to be removed. And we have to remove them again because of something called prompt dependence. And this is when the client only emits the desired target behavior when whoever is doing the teaching is using that prompt. Now, prompt dependence, you can combat this a few different ways. First of all, make sure you're using prompts only when you absolutely need to. So if the behavior can occur naturally uh, and you never needed to use a prompt, don't do it to begin with. Uh, second, you can make sure that you're only using those prompts for as long as necessary to foster a generalization, like to get the behavior to happen in the presence of more stimuli, or to foster discrimination to make sure the behavior only happens under certain circumstances. And you want to make sure that you're planning on how you're going to decrease and withdraw those prompts effectively. When we talk about prompts, there can be lots of different kinds of prompts. We can have a physical prompt, which is where I'm actually physically touching the learner and kind of moving them into, into position. Positional prompts could be myself uh, putting myself in relation to the, the learner in some way. Uh, we can do verbal prompts, like giving instructions or just small hints. We can do gestural prompts, like maybe pointing at things. Or if I'm talking to someone online and I can't hear them, I might go like this to kind of indicate that I can't communicate, I can't uh, hear that information. We also do visual prompts. So sometimes we can do things like add a little sign or change the color of something. Lots of different prompt categories that you could use. But typically when we're talking about using these in teaching, folks will describe what are called prompt hierarchies, which is just another way of describing how we're going to go about using these. Are we going to go in what's called a most to least prompting hierarchy? In a most to least prompting hierarchy, what we do is we start with the most intrusive level of prompting, and that would be a full physical, and then we might fade back a little bit into a partial physical, into a modeling, into a gestural, so on and so forth. Or are we going to start with least to most uh, intrusive prompting, right? So in this particular case, what we're talking about here is, do we want to, and I'm going to go back, do we want to go most to least? So do we want to start as intrusive as possible and then fade out as the learner gains independence? Or do we want to go least to most, where we only layer on additional support as the person needs it? There are some reasons why you might choose one over the other. Let's go back to most of least. You might choose most of least prompting uh, because you don't want the learner to make any mistakes. If it's a really high pressure situation, if someone could be harmed, if making mistakes will be detrimental for the learner or someone that they serve in some way, definitely use most of least. It's been suggested that folks who are really um, averse to experiencing extinction uh, might benefit from most of least folks who experience intellectual or developmental disability could benefit from most of these prompting. In a most of these prompting paradigm, you have the highest probability that the learner is going to omit the correct response. But there are some drawbacks here. In most of these prompting, you always have to be very, very careful that you're removing or you're moving down the prompt hierarchy levels as quickly as you possibly can, because most of these prompting can quickly foster prompt dependence. This can be a situation where the learner kind of stops uh, trying on their own and they'll rely on others to help them. Uh, it can also be pretty difficult because depending on the learner that you serve, remember that these are very physically intrusive levels of prompting. And again, depending on your learner, if you were to start with a full physical and you don't know a lot about the client that you serve, it could be dangerous for the person who's using that level of prompting. So always respect the autonomy of your client. Only touch a client if you have their permission, if you've actually asked them and you're making sure that it's okay and it's not disrespectful for them in some way. And Again, you're trying to remove these as quickly as possible so that you're getting to independence. So try to probe down to uh, lower levels of prompting as much as possible. With least to most prompting, there are some benefits here. First, this is less likely to result in prompt dependence because you're only layering on more intrusive levels of prompting as you need them. Uh, this level of, of prompting can also kind of respect the autonomy of your client because you're following their lead.
But there are some drawbacks here as well. This level or this hierarchy of prompting uh, is most likely to be one where the learner is going to contact some extinction because you have to go through multiple levels of prompting before you get down to the level where the learner will actually emit the response. So this can also take a little bit longer. This can take more trials and more time to help support someone. And so you just have to figure out what's going to work best for your client. One uh, word of advice that I would provide is remember the analysis part of behavior analysis. So look closely at the client that you're serving. Uh, know, take the information that you know about your client and use it to guide what you're going to do. If you know that you work with a client who benefits really well from gestural prompting and you often have to go down to that level, uh, start there. Right, start a gesture and go into modeling and so on and so forth. But know the information about your client. Watch very, very closely for times when maybe they're demonstrating a little independence, so you could be fading back and removing that uh, that prompting hierarchy and going back to independence as quickly as possible. And always be having a plan for how you're going to be removing prompts so that you're battling prompt dependence. So just to quickly summarize this section, remember. Prompts are those additional antecedent stimuli that we add to increase the probability of a response when it isn't occurring naturally in the presence of a, a discriminative stimulus. The overuse of prompts can cause prompt dependence. So only use prompts as much as necessary and remove them as quickly as you can. You don't want to be in a situation where the learner is dependent on the prompt because one, uh, they're not independent. Right? And independent and full living is something that we're aiming for for all of our clients. And two, you, you can kind of get a little bit resentful of the client if they're always relying on that prompt. I'm thinking of some folks that I've served, like teenage boys who will only do the chore when you tell them to do the chore. We really want that independence, so we try to fade that out as much as possible and capture those naturally occurring discriminative stimuli in the environment. And then remember, we do have these prompting hierarchies. They give us a kind of... Um, quick reference for the level of intrusiveness and where you start. There are benefits for most to least and least to most, and you want to use the one that's going to be best for your client. If you're trying to maximize independence, you may want to go from a, a least to most. If you're trying to reduce the overall number of errors that folks make, you want to use most to least. Thanks so much for joining me. I'll see you next time.